Anthony, thanks for your time. As part of a market update today, Westpac is laying out quite a lot of detail around its plans to become a net zero bank, and that includes signing up to the Net Zero Banking Alliance, but also publicly committing to quite a few new targets uh, around reducing its financed emissions. Before we get into the specifics of the targets, can you talk us through what the significance of the commitments are? The transformation needed in society is enormous if we were to realise a net zero by 2050. And so the NZBA is part of a global effort by banks to support that challenge of solving for net zero. And Westpac, therefore, in signing up to the NZBA commitments is, is putting publicly down a, a stake that it is going to be part of this solution in delivering a net zero outcome by 2050. And so I look at it as, as, a, as a public statement that we are committed to supporting the community in arriving at net zero. And we are putting tangible, measurable targets out there, which we will be held to account on. Um, and so that's how it represents our statement that we are committed to delivering on the net zero outcome that society needs. As you've mentioned, Anthony, the targets relate to the most carbon intensive sectors that the bank finances. One of those is oil and gas. Can you tell us how you're thinking about that sector and also what the new targets mean for customers operating in oil and gas? Yeah, so certainly oil and gas and, and, and is, is, is the epicenter of uh, what we need to solve for on net zero, which is we need to reduce our use of fossil fuels. Um, we do, however, see gas as having a really important role in the transition. So as we thought about setting our targets here, we've worked with our clients, we've worked with industry, and we've also looked at the um, IEA and CSIRO scenarios around uh, fossil fuel usage over the course of the next 10, 15, 20 years. So we've set our target for 2030 of reducing the absolute financed emissions by 23%. Um, and that is consistent with um, the IEA and CSI scenarios uh, that have informed how we've thought about the targets we should set here. And as part of the targets, the bank has said that it won't finance Greenfields projects, but there is a caveat there in that if the projects are deemed to be of national energy security importance, then the bank may. How likely is that? So, yeah, so that's right, and, and what we've done is followed the IEA guidelines, which is that there is no need for new greenfield developments that were not committed to as of 18 May 2021. So that's our position, which is we will not be financing any new greenfield developments that are not consistent with the IEA guidelines, and that is a project that was committed to as of May 2021. However, we did think, and we think it's appropriate, that as Australia's oldest bank and one of its largest banks, that if energy security requirements dictate otherwise, we would consider financing new projects if it was viewed by government, by regulators, that that was necessary for energy security reasons, then we will, as I said, be open to that and consider whether we would support that particular asset or opportunity. And the bank has also updated its targets around thermal coal mining. Can you talk us through that change and the thinking behind that? So we made a commitment in 2020 to reduce our exposure to the thermal coal sector by 2030 to net zero. Um, this adjustment in that commitment is that we've tightened up the definition of what a thermal coal mining company is and consistent with the NZBA guidelines, a thermal coal mining company is one where 5% or more of its revenue comes from thermal coal mining. Previously, our definition had a slightly higher threshold than that. So this is really just a, a reaffirmation of that commitment to a zero exposure to coal, thermal coal mining by 2030. And the definition of a thermal coal mining now aligns with the NZBA uh, guidelines. Power generation is another sector of interest and Westpac is already a leader when it comes to lending to renewable energy operators, and you've lifted your ambitions there as well. How big is the opportunity around renewables? So where are you seeing the commercial opportunities for the bank? So you're right, we've been a leader in renewable financing, greenfield renewable power financing in Australia for a long time. Uh, we think it's an enormous opportunity. And if we go back to the foundations here, which is the country needs to electrify almost every process activity 
uh, and uh, undertaking it, it enters into. And then the generation of that electricity needs to be done in a way which is consistent with a net zero outcome. And so renewable power is the solution for pretty much everyone in relation to getting to net zero. So it's, it's the foundation of how we get to net zero by 2050. And so we see it as a really big opportunity. Um, and we see that there's also this, a lot of adjacent investment needed in enhancing the grid to facilitate that renewable power. There's investment in services and parts and partnerships that needed to support the, the build out in this area. And so therefore it represents an enormous economic opportunity and, and for both the community uh, and for Westpac. And Anthony, no doubt there will be quite a mixed response to some of the new targets that the bank has committed to, given that there are such a wide variety of views out there around these topics. How do you think the new targets will be received, particularly by environmental activists who have been a bit critical of banks uh, in their view that banks haven't been moving pe perhaps quickly enough uh, to support the transition? So look, I think, you know, we're, we're always going to face criticism in, in, in many respects. Uh, a, a bank like Westpac or one of the big four in Australia, it's part of the course that there's criticism of what we do. Well, what we've got to do is make sure our decisions are based in, in relation to just fundamental disciplines and principles that are really important. So the way we've thought about setting these targets is they've got to be based on the best available science. They've got to be anchored around the fact that we have data and we can measure and we can therefore track accurately what target the target is and whether we're making progress there and we can share that. We also need to make sure that the industry, the clients are all contributing and partaking in this endeavour with us. And so partnering with the, the industry, partnering with the clients is a really key part of what we need to achieve. And then I think, you know, the, the other key issue here is that we can then provide and share with everyone a methodology around how we've set the targets how we're tracking versus those targets and provide transparency to everyone in the community. And so provided we have those things in place and with the help of third party experts that we've used, we can come up with these targets. Now, there are always going to be people who are unhappy with those targets, whether they're too aggressive or not aggressive enough, but those targets have been set using those principles and disciplines I've just set out. I think the other thing that we also need to make sure is that we want to ensure that we're supporting people in terms of a just transition, which means we have to bring everyone along. We can't just leave people behind and strike out and get to a net zero outcome without bringing the community along. And so we use the term just transition, and that's another balancing item in how we think about the targets. We need to ensure that it's fair and balanced in terms of the outcomes we're looking to achieve. But of course, we need to keep working and, and aiming for that net zero outcome. And just taking that forward a little bit, are you also planning to review some of the other high intensity um, emissions sectors beyond the ones that you've talked about today? So consistent with a commitment to the NZBA, um, we will need to release targets across all of our certainly most emissions intensive sectors within 18 months of making that commitment. So over the next 18 months, that's our intention is to release targets across a whole range of sectors. And finally, Anthony, just on a more broad national level, do you feel like there is enough momentum and ambition across the economy for us to get to that net zero future? Interestingly, where we sit today, we have a community that's very focused and very committed on a net zero. We also have a private sector that has now and has been for a few years very focused on its role in helping society get to a net zero. And then recently, we've now established across all three layers of government, absolute alignment on the need to achieve a net zero outcome. So I think at last we have everything that you need to achieve what needs to be achieved. Because what we have to undertake over the next 5, 10, 20 years is quite a profound change in the way we work, the way we operate, the way society uh, effectively exists because we need to transform how we do things such that we can do it in a way which is consistent with a net zero outcome. So now that we have the community, we have the private sector, and we have all layers of government aligned on that, I think we have the basis to, to achieve that. Anthony Miller, thanks for your time. Thank you.